Good evening, everyone. And today I will tell you a story about how solving some problems at a very, very tiny scale can impact the way of how we design materials. And I will try to be not as technical as I used to be. And first, l let me tell what brought me here. And uh, I grew up in a small country right in the middle of Europe, which is called Belarus. And as a matter of education, it is not a cold piece of ice as many of you think about that part of the world. Uh, weather there is more mild than in Chicago, for example. And that time, when I was a child, um, Belarus was a part of very big and very scientifically and technologically advanced empire. But after the fall of Soviet Union, the situation has changed, and I decided to go for graduate study to Germany. After graduation, I saw I had a number of options there, but, um, well, like many basketball players dream about NBA, I was dreaming to test myself by American science. And that brought me to the United States after spending several years at the very best industrial company at IBM Research and the governmental lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I gained enough confidence to start my own group at the University of Chicago. And the story that I will tell you today was inspired by a very simple observation that after uh, many centuries of trials and errors, humans realize that it is very convenient to build houses, not directly from sand and clay, but through an intermediate step of bricks or building blocks. And that led me to thinking, well, can we bring this type of ideas to the arena of functional materials, or materials are such as semiconductors, metals, magnets that we use everywhere in electronics, in solar cells, in cellular phones. Um, now, what these functional modules of a semiconductor can be? If you dig into physics, you will learn that um, in order to, you have to bring something like several thousand atoms together in order to develop the key uh, features of a parent material of a semiconductor or of a metal, and that defines the lo small or the lower limit. On the other hand, the examples of such building blocks are shown in this slide, and actually each spot is a column of atoms, so you, it, it allows you to calibrate yourself towards the atomic scale. Now these uh, objects, these modules, are small enough that they do not feel gravity. And that's another very important point, because you can uh, dissolve them or disperse them like you dissolve, sh dissolve sugar in water and make an ink or paint that you can put everywhere. So after you put a layer of this paint on some substrate and let it dry, the building blocks, the modules, will come together and assemble themselves into this long-range ordered arrays where each spot, e each a unit is a tiny piece of a semiconductor or a magnet or a metal, or you can grow three-dimensional crystals built out of these tiny building blocks. Um, well, and here let me draw an analogy or show you an example from Mother Nature. Uh, I'm sure most of you are aware of these very beautiful uh, jewelry stones, opals, and which are amazing colors. The color change when you change the directions of view. And actually, the most amazing thing about these opals is that chemically they are incredibly simple and incre incredibly boring materials. Their chemical composition is same as sand. And what makes, what brings this very boring sand of type chemical compositions into one of the most beautiful things on, on the Earth is their internal structure. Actually, we don't know for sure how, but Mother Nature actually assembles them, in a, from a, a first assembles this silica, silicon dioxide, in a very small balls, and packs these balls in, an, in form of arrays like we see here. So 
you can see that this control of structure at can transform a very simple, very boring material into such a beautiful stones. And we can go further. We can precisely design these building blocks. We can uh, control their size, shape, or we can combine several components into each block, into each module. For example, a piece of magnet integrated right into semiconductor and then pack them into an array. Or we can take another uh, approach where we can take uh, combine two different ma materials in form of the building blocks. Let's say in this central image, the large uh, sphere, the large module can be a semiconductor, and small module can be a metal or a magnet or catalyst. It's, it's that flexible and that powerful. And, well, if you think that, well, it's the end of the journey, no. We still have one very important challenge to address. It's not sufficient to pack, to pack this, uh, to, since to prepare these building blocks and to pack them together. It's also, if you want to see some development of really amazing and really unprecedented properties, um, the building blocks should talk to each other. And here, let me uh, draw an analogy with the atomic world, with traditional chemistry that we all learned in high school. Uh, for example, if you take a sodium and chlorine and make a chemical bond behind, uh, between them, you generate totally new material, sodium chloride, salt that we use to salt our food. And exactly the same type of ideas should be applied to design of materials from these building blocks. And so we should really develop a new chemistry and new ways how to force them to talk to each other. So in a, an array like that, uh, the strands of communication or the talk between the crosstalk between the building blocks is can be described with as electron moving through this array. And if you don't care about interfaces, if you don't care about what separates these building blocks, actually the electron will feel in such structure itself as a car would feel on such a bumpy road. And it will not move fast. And it will get stuck eventually very quickly. So that was a big challenge several years ago. And I'm really happy to say that we developed a very uh, powerful approach how to connect these building blocks. We, de we develop, developed a whole new chemistry called electronic glue that uh, allows you to connect the building blocks and convert that bumpy road into highway. And that opens up a number of opportunities. And the most important opportunity is uh, the solution processed or material, or printable, or paintable uh, materials, semiconductors. And an example is solar cell. And uh, actually, solar cells and photovoltaics is a very mature technology. But the main problem is cost. And to run your house, you, sh you have to have something like 5 kilowatt panel at, the, at your roof. And that costs way above 10k at this moment. But if you take a commercial solar cell and dissect it, you will see that it's nothing but a several layers of different semiconductors and conductors on top of each other in form of a stack. And I'm not aware of any scientifically sound reason why this layered structure cannot be made by printing or uh, spraying or painting in the same way as you can paint your garage door. And the only challenge well, big challenge is that we don't know what should be the solar, the solar paint, and or we didn't know. And I think now we have a very scientifically supported uh, set of ideas, and we understand what should be there. So after many years of research, I'm getting confident that such functional building blocks or such functional modules of different materials, of, for example, semiconductor or, or metal or magnet, uh, can be used and should be used as high-tech bricks for building materials, for building your future solar cells. And at the very, to summarize, I want to emphasize the opportunities that we have here. We can use literally the entire periodic table to design these building blocks, to uh, tune, to tailor their properties, and then use them to design materials in a totally different way than we used to do. 
And so that's, at this point, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>